Frequency Podcast Network. Stories that matter, podcasts that resonate. There are some places that capture the imagination of those who visit and hold on to it. You can probably think of a few from your own life. And if you're from Western Canada or even if you've just ever visited, Jasper National Park might well be one of them. And so although those of us who experience Jasper as visitors can't imagine what it feels like to be a Jasperite right now, we share the sense of loss with all of those who live in the town who care for it. That was Alberta Premier Danielle Smith at a news conference last week speaking about the hold that Jasper has on so many and how devastating it was to watch a massive fire rip through it. As much as half of Jasper is gone, engulfed by flames overnight. That was the update from provincial officials who estimate anywhere between 30 and 50 percent of the buildings in the town site were either damaged or destroyed by wildfire. The fire that destroyed so much of Jasper, by the way, is still burning. It's lurking right now on the edge of town, held at bay by firefighters and hopefully soon some desperately needed rain. This is not an episode about the massive fires of the climate change era and how we brought them on ourselves. We've already done that episode quite recently. This is a story about a place, about people's homes and their lives, and the memories of that place that so many visitors carried with them. It's a story about what happened to Jasper, in one night, just like that. And what happens now? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Sean Amato is a reporter with City News Edmonton who has been covering the fire in Jasper. Hey, Sean. Hello. Why don't we just start... Uh, For Eastern Canadians who may have heard about it, may have never been there, uh, describe Jasper for us. What's it like? What is it? Yeah, it's it's one of the most beautiful places on the earth that I've I've seen. Definitely, the mountains are big and rocky and have beautiful faces on the side of them. The water is uh, crisp and very cold, and uh, uh, this beautiful blue green color. There's wildlife all over. There's there's sheep. There's elk, uh, there's bears around town all the time. And it is just a beautiful place. Um, For Albertans, it's sort of a local playground. Uh, It's a place I grew up going to for for holidays to visit family. It's the place that I learned how to ski and snowboard uh, at Marmot Basin, which is a beautiful facility there. But it's also a place for that international tourist. Um, you'll be sitting there uh, having a patio beer and, and a bus full of people from Japan or China or Germany or England will, will roll through. Um, so it, it really is a magical place for a lot of people. And maybe if you don't mind, you know, you mentioned you came up around there. You have family there. Uh, is your family OK? What happened to them? Yeah, so my aunt still lives there. Um, she's, she's retired. She just loves Jasper. She always goes home to Jasper. She never wants to leave Jasper. She has a beautiful little community there. She's part of the Rotary Club. She's part of her local church. Mm. Uh, she goes on walking uh, walking dates with people. She she has a, a membership at the local golf club. Like she's she's very much a part of the community, and she loves the little community that is there. It's it's not a big community, but she was woken up at about eleven p.m. Uh, a knock on her door. And told she had to get out uh, with everybody else, 5,000 people, residents, plus uh, workers, plus visitors to the park, and, and told she needed to get out. So she drove west to BC. I have a cousin in, in Victoria, BC, and uh, my aunt said that there was, there was no hotels, there was people everywhere. So she just decided to, uh, to put the pedal to the floor and, and go all the way to, to Victoria, where she's now, um, she's now with family and she's, she's safe. That's good to hear. And that was late last week. Uh, it is now a Monday morning. 
this fire is still burning out of control right now, right? How long has it been burning? And maybe just take us back to the beginning of this. Uh, what do we know about like where this fire came from and how it developed? Yeah, so it started, uh, there's actually two fires. There's one uh, that hit the town and that one came from the south. There's a valley to the south down Highway 93. The first mention I can find of that fire was the 19th. But I was talking to a fire official there at the scene and, and he was telling me that um, it's tough to pinpoint exactly where that started because what happened was there was a bunch of lightning in that valley south of Jasper and a bunch of little fires actually merged into, into the monstrosity that, uh, that blew into Jasper and, and hit the town from the south. That was Wednesday night. And there was also a fire that I saw up close and personal on the north side of Jasper the day before it hit the town, uh, the RCMP were giving us a tour of Jasper. They were trying to give us a tour of Jasper. And as we came around the corner, we could just see this massive fire. And it was blowing very close to the highway, the only highway in. And the RCMP ended up stopping the tour. We got out, we took some pictures, and then they said, it's just too dangerous to drive through there. We could see fire. We could see helicopters dropping uh, water on that fire. So... There are two, two fires. Those have since merged as well. So it's now what they call a complex fire. A number of, of fires have come together there. And yeah, it's, it's still, still threatening the town. They're talking about building fire breaks to make sure it doesn't blow back into town. They're talking about putting sprinkler systems up to protect the north and west side of the town, the, ta the part of the town that's still, uh, still standing. So yeah, the firefight is, is certainly not over there. And it we're supposed to get rain in Jasper today, I believe. And then by the end of the week, it's supposed to be 28 degrees again, which is bad news. You mentioned you were there getting a tour. You were also up there in the thick of it the night last week that some of the town burned. Can you describe uh, what happened, what it was like up there compared to uh, all the times you'd been to, to Jasper and the surrounding region previously? Yeah, it was eerily quiet because everything was closed. Media were staging at a roadblock about 40 kilometers away from, from the town. I've actually witnessed towns burn down before. I was in Slave Lake in 2011. When it burned down, I watched town center burn down. I was also in Fort McMurray in 2016, uh, right in the middle of the fire, and I watched neighborhoods burn down. Uh, this one, because of the, the timing of everything, everybody had been evacuated before reporters were able to arrive just because everything happened so quickly. So we didn't actually watch uh, Jasper burn down. Very few people did. It was only emergency crews. And at one point, they actually evacuated staff from Jasper, firefight wildland firefighters, um, other support staff who didn't have breathing apparatuses. They had to get them out of there. So we were standing at a roadblock watching uh, everything unfold from, from where we were. And uh, at times it went black, uh, completely black, and the street lights came on and it was, it was 6 p.m. It was also raining ass on us. Um, we, we were parked there for, for a few hours. And by the time we left it, our windshields and our hoods and our roofs of our vehicles were completely covered with ash. But we were seeing people coming through. We we're seeing firefighters coming through and the look on people's faces you know, you could tell that something was was wrong. At one point, a man driving a tow truck, uh, a local tow truck, rolled through the the roadblock, and um, he rolled down his window and he he said to me and the other reporters there, he said, uh, he said, "She's over, boys. There's not going to be a town left in the morning." And at that point, we didn't know whether that was true or not, but but. Judging by the way that he said it and that the sorrow in his voice, and the pain in his voice, I, I believe that he believed that. And that it wasn't that long after that, that the fire did hit the town. What do we know now, a few days later? And as you mentioned, uh, firefighters still right now protecting the town. But what do we know about how much of the town did burn down and, and what burned? Yeah, so about 30% of the town is gone. 358 buildings destroyed. They said uh, seven were also damaged. So there is still about 70% of town left there. The, the vast majority of the things that burned down, uh, there was a hotel, uh, there was two gas stations, there was a home hardware, there was some, some business areas uh, on their main strip and their, in their little downtown core there. The vast majority of things, though, that burned down were homes. And we were speaking to the mayor of Jasper 
uh, he went on a tour and he came back and, and confirmed that, yes, in fact, his own home had, had been destroyed. He told us a story about how he was kind of coming around the corner and he saw that both of his neighbors' homes were, were still standing and his garage was still standing, but eventually he got close enough to see that his house was destroyed. So it, we're looking at a map of it as well. They've, re, they've released a map of, of the damage and, and it kind of confirms what I've known um, from other forest fire scenes is that it's, it's very random. The wind blows things around, the wind blows embers around and, and you'll, you will see you know, a whole block of houses is fine, but two in the middle are gone. And that's sort of sort of what we've we've seen there as well. The good news is that all their critical infrastructure is still there. The hospital is there, the schools are there, the wastewater treatment plant is there, uh, their emergency services building there, so their their fire and um, and police station are still there. So there is a lot gone, but there's also a lot to rebuild from. You mentioned uh, that your aunt went all the way to Victoria. What do we know about how many people were evacuated, not only from uh, Jasper, but I gather there are evacuations from uh, some First Nation communities in the area uh, and other places. And what do we know about, you know, where all those people go uh, at a time like this? This is not, uh, you know, a few people to put somewhere. No, they say there was about 25,000 people in the park at the time. And it's important to note that it wasn't just the town of Jasper. It was the entire national park that had to leave. Initially, all those folks went west um, on Highway 16 into B.C. Uh, the next sort of community there is, is Valmont, B.C. And a lot of people, thousands of people either stayed the night there. Some of them are still there. But what we're starting to learn is that people kind of scattered. They, they went where they needed to go. They went where they could stay with family, where they could find a place. Some of the people that I talked to um, drove many, many hours. We're talking like 15, 16 hours to loop around to the other side of the fire. And they're now staying in Hinton, which is the, um, the community on the east side, about 45 minutes away. That's sort of the, the bedroom community there. And some of the people uh, have RVs there or they have family there or they have a second home there, that sort of thing. But but what we've know what we know now is that that people have really scattered and they're everywhere. And in Alberta, sadly, we have some experience with this. It was weeks before people from Slave Lake could go home. It was 28 days before people from Fort McMurray could go home. So I think, sadly, we're we're used to this, where people know that okay, I'm not going home anytime soon. I need to find a place where I'm comfortable. And a lot of times, that's with family, and that's that's wherever wherever they they be. What has the official response been in terms of coordinating resources, in terms of helping people who are displaced? I know we played a clip in in the intro to this of Premier Daniel Smith uh, visibly and audibly uh, upset at a press conference last week. Are they working with the feds? What's going on on the government level? Yeah, it's a good question. And it's, it, it actually has tested people's knowledge about what jurisdiction is here, because we're talking about this is a national park. So federally, they, they have jurisdiction over the park. Parks Canada is, is sort of running things or at least taking the lead on things. Um, Alberta Wildfire is, is also a strong organization, but it's not primarily their jurisdiction. For them, it counts as a mutual aid fire. So they're working with Parks Canada. Also, there's some, been some talk on, on Twitter about who's to blame. Is Trudeau to blame? Is, is uh, Daniel Smith funded uh, firefighting well enough? Jasper itself is a municipality, which technically, although it, they deal a lot with Parks Canada because those are their immediate neighbors, it's a municipality, so technically it's, it's part of the province. But all this to say, uh, we talked to all of those officials. The mayor, federal minister Harjit Sajin was there. Um, Daniel Smith was there in, in Hinton and, and did a tour. They all agreed that that while there's a lot to figure out here, uh, and I'm sure they'll be doing some sort of uh, a debrief, uh, some sort of investigation into what went right and what went wrong, they all seem to agree. And I asked the question that, that everybody did everything they could, that this was an unstoppable force of nature. This was uh, 125 kilometer an hour wind gusts, 400 foot wall of flame coming into town and, and no amount of, of preparation before 
on no amount of firefighting that night could have stopped it. That's what they're agreeing on right now. But I know a lot of people want want an investigation done. They they want to see, well, they they want to see this never happen again. And and sadly, in in 15 years, it, it's happened um, three times in Alberta. We've talked mostly so far about damage to the town and the infrastructure. You know, Jasper is one of Canada's, uh, if not the world's, uh, best, most beautiful national parks. What do we know about uh, what has happened to the ecosystem there, to the forest, and uh, to all those all those animals you mentioned that live there? Yeah, I mean, I think wildfire is is a natural part of of that ecosystem. Uh, you know, I, I was there a couple of years ago um, because they also had a fire and it knocked out power and they were telling people to stay away. And thankfully that that didn't hit the town. And people at the time were kind of ho-hum, you know, like, oh, this is what happens. We live in a forested area and there's going to be fires and there's going to be regeneration. And um, I remember even as a kid driving through Jasper and seeing, okay, this part burned a couple of years ago and there's new growth over here and this sort of thing. So that is that is part of, of life. It's part of, of living there. I was really... Uh, a colleague of mine went into to Jasper yesterday for the media tour. They took a bus through, and he was sending videos of of animals in Jasper. And uh, he said looking quite comfortable. And judging by the video, that was true. So that was that was really nice to see. A lot of people shared that video. A lot of people were were really happy to see that that the animals uh, were were okay. At least the ones that we could see. I'm assuming the parks will will go in and do a, an even bigger assessment of of what's going on there with the ecosystem. But wildfire is is a natural part of that ecosystem. In the meantime, as all this is going on, and uh, still the fires are being fought to protect uh, what's left of the town. What about other fires? As I understand it, it's an incredibly active season, and there are more fires to be concerned about. Well, this one still burns. Yeah, it is. I mean, uh, when Jasper was on fire, there was about 170 other fires in in Alberta, northern and western Alberta. We had just gone through a wicked heat wave here in Alberta, and we were setting records just about every day. Uh, It was about seven days in a row, eight days in a row, where we were above 30 degrees. And that's not normal for, for Alberta. So it has been very hot. It's been very dry. We've uh, a provincial drought was declared, uh, I believe, last year. But we're definitely in a drought. It's been hot. It's been dry. Thankfully, it has been raining, and we have cooler temperatures now. I checked the dashboard this morning. I think it was about 120 fires still still going in the province. So we're in a bit better shape. We could always use more rain in Alberta. Thankfully, I mean, when we were up there, it it poured for a whole day on on Hinton and an area, and people were really happy to see it because that is an area that we all staged to. That's an area they moved the mobile command post to, but everybody there in town agreed that they were kind of sitting ducks for for a fire as well, just because there's so many trees. It's so close to Jasper. It's been so dry there. Um, so we we still need rain. Last question. Uh, in the big picture, you know, you mentioned uh, three times in the last 15 years in Alberta town has been pretty decimated by fire. Uh, everybody remembers Lytton, B.C. as well, which still hasn't been rebuilt. As these kind of fires that can destroy a lot of a town become more common, are people talking about changing the way we fight them, more funds to to provide more firefighters to protect them? Or is it, uh, it sometimes doesn't matter to your point if the fire's far enough out of control? Yeah, that's certainly a discussion that's going on. Um, you know, does Justin Trudeau need to, to buy more water bombers? Do we, do we need to add firefighters? Um, how do we do these things? The one thing I can tell you that we've learned is that we're getting people out earlier. I was in Slave Lake um, when at one point they told us to go to the Walmart parking lot because there was no way out of town. They told us to find an area of, of water to, to literally go in a lake because there was no way to get out of town. Thankfully, the highway opened up and, and we were able to get out of town. But, but uh, that was, I saw the panic on people's faces. That didn't happen this time. Thankfully, uh, we have learned to get people out earlier. Um, and that was a huge, huge element of what happened here. But um, 
Yeah, I mean, uh, a fire is a, is a force of nature, and I've, I've seen it firsthand. Um, in Fort McMurray, they declared beyond resources, which means it's just, there's nothing humans can do. They just need to get out of the way, and that's what happened in Fort McMurray. I'm told that's what happened here in Jasper as well, is they, they ended up pulling people out and saying, there's no way we can fight this. So this certainly does bring up more questions about are we preparing these communities? Do we have enough resources? How do we fight these fires? I was asking those questions of, of the mayor and I, I asked him point blank. I said, did everybody do everything they could to prevent this from happening? And he said, the short answer is yes. He says, we choose to live in a forested area. Uh, they have a fire smart program, which, which goes through and, and is um, to manage the forest, to try to reduce fire risk. They try to remove fuels. They try to create fire breaks. They try to do those kinds of things. And the federal minister agreed that their fire smart program is first class. And yet this still happened. Sean, thank you so much for this. Best of luck to everybody out there and uh, to you as you guys continue to cover this. Thanks for having me and, and much love to everybody in Jasper. Sean Amato with City News Edmonton. That was The Big Story. For more, you can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. As you might imagine, over the past couple of years, we have covered this kind of forest fire from every angle imaginable. You can go and hear some of them if you're up for it. I don't blame you if you're not. You can send us feedback by writing to hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca or by calling 416-935-5935 and leaving us a voicemail. The Big Story is available in all your podcast players and it's on smart speakers. Just ask them to play The Big Story Podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow. Tomorrow.